Well, another day, another 50 cents. Uh, the week comes to a, uh, a grinding close with yet another program for your listening enjoyment <laughs> or complete and utter amusement. Boy, that, what a sell job that was. That was such a good sell job, Bob. Well, I don't have to pretend to be in a good mood. Uh, You're not in a good mood? I didn't say that. I just don't have to pretend to be in one. Oh. I'm in the same mood I'm usually in. Oh, my goodness gracious. Warn the neighbors. Uh, yours truly, Bob McCowan. Uh, that's John Shannon over there. Well, we're going to spend uh, some time talking basketball uh, uh, today. Uh, but having said that, um, we probably should address the situation that took place in the National Hockey League last night where the team that you predicted would win this series in three games um, is now forced to extend to at least five. Mm -hmm. And if you're a Toronto Maple Leaf fan at the end of last night's game, this was like the horror movie that you've seen over and over and over and over again. Did anything that happened last night change your opinion on how this series will ultimately come out? Well, uh, yeah, if, uh, if the Maple Leafs number two center is gone for the series and John Tavares, it does change a bit of the scope of the, of, of what's going on, not only for what he contributes on the ice, uh, but the ripple effect of him not being around and the influence that he has, um, on, on his teammates. I, I think you saw that for gosh, Bob, two and a half periods. Uh, last night, I think the team played in shock for 40 minutes uh, when it came to what happened to John Tavares and that unfortunate incident with uh, Ben Sherratt and, and Corey Perry. It was, you know, it 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 sent a huge, huge message of insecurity to the Toronto Maple Leafs. And and you, you, first of all, yeah, you hope John Tavares is all right, and every player on the ice did that. Uh, but that, to me, it does change the complexion of this series a bit. Well, as we talk here, uh, we don't know exactly what John's condition is, but it, it seems as though he's, it's not as, as serious as it appeared. Well, he, he, he's, he's uh, as we tape, he's still in hospital. He, there is an expectation he will be released later this afternoon. Yeah. Um, and he, had, he did pass all his tests last night and this morning. Uh, so there are some, there are some positives. Listen, he, he just got knocked silly. Yep. With a knee to the head. That's what happened. He got knocked silly. Uh, and it's, gosh, it was, it was unfortunate. And, and it was even more amplified, Bob, with nobody in the building. Because w when, uh, when, when you're sitting at home, as 99.9% .9 of us are watching this game, um, and the announcers don't speak, and there are lots of times in that, in that, uh, that episode that they didn't and shouldn't have spoken, the silence was absolutely frightful, frightful. So well, that, that, I uh, will, that, that's, that's, uh, that's something to be concerned about. I, I will certainly concede the impact of that injury could play a significant role in the outcome of the series and maybe, maybe, maybe played a role in last night's game. But I would also say of greater concern to Lee fans should be the performance of Carey Price last night, who... Um, has long been viewed as the best goaltender in the National Hockey League when he's healthy mm -hmm. and um, certainly a one-man wrecking crew when it comes to the playoffs. Um, maybe, when he's healthy. Yeah, maybe no goaltender in the NHL right now, maybe, can have as much impact on, a, on the outcome of a game as Carey Price can. Oh, wow. And he was essentially unbeaten last night. The one yes, goal that, no. that, that got in was one of those kind of dribblers that went by him. And before he could get his hand on it, um, yeah. it got poked into the net, but they, they didn't really beat him. And um, he played well. Sure. He did. You know, remember how well he played in the bubble last summer, Bob. I sure he, do. He got them. He got them through a first round matchup uh, last summer too, against Pittsburgh, almost so. all on his own. Yeah. The, and the interesting thing is, uh, you know, for Montreal Canadiens fans, there was a huge outcry that they weren't playing the kids. They weren't playing the goal scorer of Cole Caulfield. Uh, KK wasn't going to play. Well, maybe the coach and the manager know exactly what they're doing because they had a game plan that worked. Now, 
I actually thought Canadians were in trouble in the third period because their power play was so ineffective that all it all it would take for the Maple Leafs is is one quick attack and a, and and a goal, and that's what this Maple Leaf offense can still do. And and I I still have some confidence as long as they can create some traffic in front of Price, and that's a big if. If they can can uh, create traffic in front of Price, then I I think uh, I still think Toronto will prevail. Well, I. I offer no opinion on it. I didn't yesterday, and I won't. I won't today. Um, I would say yeah, if it's be, not like you to not like you to take a stand on a series, you know. So, well, no, I just I I had no real sense of this. <laughs> well, yeah. on one hand, the Toronto Maple Leafs proved themselves to be the better team over the course of the year, but 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 Montreal Canadiens played the last what couple of months without Carey Price, and that they also they also played the last couple of months with a reason. They played with a reason to get to the playoffs. They, I, they played a lot more important games in the last two months than the Maple Leafs did, who were who basically coasted for the last 30 days. Well, the other thing that, that comes into play here is um, the Toronto Maple Leafs have this long history of stubbing their toe in the first round and finding a way to lose. And sometimes yeah. it's definitive like it was last year, and sometimes it's – bizarre like it was against boston a few years ago when they were up 4-1 in the third period of game seven but that was a long time ago bob at eight some, years ago okay but to and and to these players that probably means nothing but to a fan you yeah. there is a lingering recollection of this string of of early exits and until they get past round one um I think you got to be, you got to, you can't yeah. be optimistic. You got to be cautious. No question. By the way, uh, and I know we got to get to the basketball uh, preview, but um, the other, there were two other games on at the same time. They were 20 times better than the Maple Leaf game. The Pittsburgh Islander game was spectacular. Pittsburgh winning on Long Island. Uh, and the Florida Tampa game, it was like watching uh, Harlem Globetrotters on both teams. It was a wild, wild game, and Florida ended up winning in Tampa, so it means nobody's won on home ice yet, and that's going to be a really good series. Of Florida wins six to five, uh, and a young guy, uh, Ryan Longberg from Richmond Hill, Ontario, who has never really had a chance to prove himself after eight or nine years of being a pro, scores the overtime winner. It was it was as much as I was glued to watch trying to watch the Leaf game because of the Tavares incident. The other two games were so compelling so much more exciting than the Maple Leaf Canadians game was. Well, and I'll tell you, I watch, I also watched the, um, unlike you, I did not watch the other. No, you watched the, you watched the Blue Jays, didn't you? That was, what, what a circus. Well, I was, was back and forth between the Blue Jays and, yeah. and, and the Maple Leafs and neither one of them was satisfying at the end of the evening. But then the Vegas game was on later against Minnesota. And I um, almost accidentally clued into that. And it was two nothing quickly for Minnesota. And then Vegas absolutely dominated. Destroyed them. them. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had some questions. There are a lot of people that said, you know, Minnesota could give Vegas some trouble. They did during the regular season. They might in these playoffs because of the style they play. Um, Vegas looks like they're going to be on cruise control. Now, you never can well, tell by one game. but mi- 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 Minnesota has one line. One line. Uh, Erickson Eck. Felino and Greenway, but Greenway did not finish. He was a little banged up last night. Those guys are big body hockey players. They were dominating uh, Vegas in the first period early. Yeah. And yeah. And that they were the difference makers. And by the end of the game, they were non-factor, which was After, fascinating to see. Yeah. The last two periods, Vegas, skill set, um, speed. And how about, how about, everything. how about Alex Petrangelo last night? Oh my goodness gracious. Well, now, you know why they spent all that money on him. Who, who sleepwalked through most of the regular season, it seems, and uh, just turned it boy, on. Oh, boy. He was, had to. Was he just, like, just like Carey Price. Well, and that's my point, Lee fans. Yeah, Sleep well tonight because uh, you got another one coming up tomorrow. Did the Toronto Raptors choke? Did they fold? Was it deliberate? Should they have? Did the fact that they threw in the towel when they're playing in Tampa mitigate the impact of that decision, which is, in my mind, unquestioned? 
We will talk to our guests, uh, Eric Smith of Sportsnet, Scott Stinson of the National Post will join us when uh, the program continues after these messages. It's McCowan, it's uh, Shannon for this uh, Friday. Uh, we, um, we are here with a couple of uh, basketball boys. Eric Smith of Sportsnet, uh, Scott Stinson of the National Post both join us. Uh, greetings to both of you, first of all. Secondly, is there any doubt that the Toronto Raptors gagged this season deliberately? Or, um, and I know, E, you, you've been on before, and we, we sort of had this conversation, and I understand that there was a little bit of doubt in there, but has essentially Masai acknowledged that he threw in the towel deliberately this year? E, to you first. Yeah, I mean, a, a couple of days ago when he spoke, he certainly acknowledged that he wanted to see the younger players and see the development and use it as a chance to, to kind of gauge what he's got, what he needs and, and, and whatnot. And that's kind of, I suppose, if you want to read between the lines, it's, hey, we were okay with how things played out because we were looking at big picture. And, uh, and when he comes right out and says, playing, playing for what? Uh, I'd say if that's coming straight down from the president that he wasn't necessarily interested in, in uh, a play-in tournament, um, you know, he wants to be competing for championships. So, so you know, describe it as you will, Bobcat, uh, when you've got guys that could be playing and you've got Kyle Lowry uh, sort of giving the half grin, talking out of the side of his mouth, saying, you know, that he's nice and rested and ready for the offseason. You know, I I'm sure he could have played. And if the Raptors were in a better position, uh, he would have played. So it, it kind of is what it is at this point. Stinson, where are you on this? Yeah, I think... I think they honestly thought they could maybe make some noise um, after the, the bad start. Then they kind of got it rolling. They got up to fourth in the East and then the COVID thing happened and they had a one in 13 month, I believe it was. And I think that's the point where they basically decided to throw in the towel. I mean, we know that they were shopping Kyle Lowry. Uh, they weren't willing to give him away for nothing, but when you're a seller at the trade deadline, you're, you're pretty much acknowledging that you'd rather lose games and get a better draft pick than then try to make a push to whatever low playoff seed you might be able to get so i i don't think they set out at the start of the season to, to tank so to speak but i think they once it all went sideways and they had the big COVID outbreak and all those losses piled up they were they definitely deliberately decided that they they weren't interested in trying to scratch and claw for the ninth or tenth seed and maybe a play in and and i mean I think part of that, in, I think Eric would agree, is that, you know, they didn't, I don't think they realized how hard the Tampa situation was going to be. And, and as the season went on, I just think they were like, you know what, we're done with this. Let's just finish it, what we have to do, and hope next year looks different and we don't have to deal with this nonsense again. Well, it raises this question for me. Uh, I have seen nothing about any kind of punishment levied by the National Basketball Association against them, which is not to say that it hasn't happened. For what? For what? For tanking, for deliberately deliberately trying to lose oh, games. When you Bob. sit out four of your five starters for an extended period of time, I think you should, you know, this is, this is contrary to, to the principles of, of sport and professional sport. Now, if you're the Philadelphia 76ers from a few years ago, and there've been other teams that have done this in all kinds of sports, where at the beginning of the year, you say, all right, we're, we're gonna play these guys. We're not gonna go get free agents. We're not gonna make trades. We're gonna do this, that, and the other thing. That's one thing. When you essentially quit two thirds or three quarters of the way through the season and do it so blatantly that you, from time to time, feign that certain players are hurt, and then ultimately acknowledge, well, they really weren't that hurt. We just, we were oh, trying to lose. Come on. What are you, listen, I know cannabis is legal in Ontario, but I don't know what you're smoking. That is the silliest thing you've ever said. The, the NBA is, is going to find them. Come on. Eric. Oh, well, listen, that Eric. Is, listen, here's, here, listen, no, listen, here's the thing. I, I thought Masai's revelation is, listen, we're going to play the young guys. And if we get in, we're okay. And if we don't get in, we know what the young guys, I think, it, I think he viewed it as a win-win situation. And based on what was going on with Tampa, I think the NBA should be giving the, I forget about a fine. I think the NBA should be giving the Raptors a medal for trying to get through this season more than anything else. That's come on. Ridiculous hey, thing come on. Bob, I, I would say this. You, you look at what the Raptors did in April, no matter who was on the floor, 
the Raptors won a hell of a lot more. I mean, listen, it's not hard to improve. I, I acknowledge on, on one win in March, but they had a hell of a lot better April than they certainly did March. They were still in it by mid to late April-ish in terms of in it, i.e. competing for that 10th seed. You still saw Nick Nurse, even in May, in the last handful of games, I'm thinking he, about even the, the last game of the season, scratching and clawing right down to the final 20, 30 sure. seconds of the game. I acknowledge that. I agree. But here's, here's the slippery slope, Bob, that, that you go down, is that I think the only player, I may be wrong on this, I don't know if Scott would agree or not, I think the only player we could sit here and really question or argue is Kyle Lowry, because it did sure seem like he was healthy and resting, and as I say, he was even smiling about it. But there were legitimate injuries to OG Ananobi, to Pascal Siakam, to, to Fred Van Vliet, two of the three, by the way, actually, no, excuse me, all three of which dealt with COVID as well. And unless any one of the four of us has had it, I know I haven't, we don't know about the long-term effects, ramifications, impact, et cetera, on that. So if we just look at Lowry and in the isolated situation, Bob and, and John and Scott, the precedent was already set to me in other seasons for sure, but even in this season with the Detroit Pistons and Blake Griffin, with the Cleveland Cavaliers in Andre sure. Drummond. Those two teams came out and said, we are actively shopping these guys and we are not playing them until we trade them. Those guys sat on the bench in street clothes for months upon end awaiting trades that ultimately went Eric, down. Bob wants to find, right? he wants the Cavaliers and the Pistons fined. He wants yes, them fined. He wants them fined. Yes, why, I do. Why? What, what, why? So, so all the people that were in the building could get their money back? Come on, Bob. This was not the year to be finding people. This was not the year to be finding people. Come on. Well, I, I, I think you're that, smarter than this. I, I think that there is a point that Bob's making, which is that um, the NBA has tried to deal with the idea of just resting guys for the sake of resting guys. The famously, the San Antonio Spurs and Greg Popovich were the first team to just sit guys even if they're on national television big showdown with the lakers and they'd be like yes you know, manager nobody's not playing and and the league did take some action to try to say you can't do that you're not allowed to just you know load manage guys uh randomly because they might be tired but clearly the system has some flaws and as eric points out the situation with kyle was particularly weird in that you know he was getting seven straight games of rest at the end of the season what was he resting for? He was resting up to, for his golf game because, you know, there's, there was no chance that they were going to make the playoffs at that point. And they just, they, they didn't even bother. They're just saying, yeah, he's resting. So the league has to figure out, you know, if you're going to say, okay, do we intend to trade this guy? So therefore we don't want to play him and decrease his value and have him risk injury, you know, apply for a special dispensation or something. But it definitely seems like they tried to do some some way of, of making sure that you can just leave guys out. And the Raptors certainly took advantage of whatever the loophole is in the in the you know league requirement to just leave a guy on the bench for the end of the season. So by the, by the way, that load management a- stuff, Scott, that load management stuff when it came to the, the, the Spurs and the Lakers. It just so happened that might have been an ESPN night or a TNT night, and the rights holders right. would be a little ticked off with the ratings. Sure. It had yeah, little absolutely. to do with the little to do with the and and I I just this was this is such a strange year. I think you take all of those rules and you throw them out the window. I mean, and particularly for a team that basically played seventy two road games, seventy two yeah, road and, games. And I do wonder if if they had been playing in Toronto. I mean, I don't think Kyle would have not played for the last. I agree two with that. Season. Yeah. That was, there's no doubt that playing in Tampa in front of nobody and then at the end in front of a handful of people that you really don't care about because they're not, they're just looking for something to do in Tampa mitigated, yeah, the, just... Im- mitigated the impact of this. You know, yeah. if they had 19,000 paying customers in the building here, do they do this? I don't think I don't so. Think so. I don't think they can get away with it. Maybe you arrest one guy a night and you know lie about whether he's hurt or not but you have you have four guys who are the cornerstone of the franchise can you have four cornerstones i don't know i guess you can it's a corner you can well um, <laughs> what, what, uh, well you yeah, don't you have, a, have you don't really have a center that you know you're trying to find out who can play center but your other four guys are guys you know and um you know they're the basis of your team when you sit all four of them consecutive nights, more than a consecutive nights for several nights in a row, you know it's deliberate. You you know that there's there's no questioning whether this is 
um, all injury related. And you had guys coming back and playing. I don't know how many times Pascal Siakam sat out, then came back for a game or two and then, and, and went out Van Vliet yep. did it for the last what month of the season. E he, he yeah, played he, one or two games. Didn't seem to be hurt. Didn't show any signs that he was injured most of the time. And then you wouldn't see him for two or three more years. I mean, listen, you're not wrong, Bob. He was in and out of the lineup, no, no doubt. But I think in a roundabout way, you almost came back to either answer your own question or, or to essentially agree with John. If there were exactly. people. Exactly. Not possible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if there were people in the building, would the Raptors have done this? Probably not. If there were paid people, if it was in Toronto, would they have done this? Probably not. The fact that they're playing in Tampa in front of little to nobody, in front of fans that were, were booing the Raptors and cheering for the opposition on many nights, playing for nothing eliminated from the play-in, you kind of throw your hands up and say, all right, then we're, we're looking ahead to next season. We're looking ahead to the draft. And it, again, I'll say the slippery slope of, you know, to use the hockey example that we always hear, do we want to go down the path of upper body injury, lower body injury, where we can just make things up then and just create these injuries and just be very kind of vague about it? Yeah, you know what? Kyle Lowry is hurt. He's, he's out. He has a uh, lower body injury, period. And then nobody questions it. It's done. Okay, he's got a lower body injury. As opposed to, no, he's, he's simply resting or he's got a toe issue or he's Fred Van Vliet. He's got an ankle. He's got a hip. He's got a whatever. So I, I, I don't know. I, I tell you what, I tell you what, the interesting thing, Eric, is, is that the transparency in sports when it comes to injuries is going to have to come more and more truth because of gambling, right? Because of gambling. That's yep. right. And now, you know, we have well, 20 why the there's only States. one league that absolutely discloses injuries and is mandated to do so. And that's the National Football League. Right. But, but, of- but all the other leagues are on board now, Bob, all the other leagues are trying to, they're, they're trying to find that Holy grail of their percentage of, of dollars. And, and it's it, wait till it, you know, it's going to come to our country too. It's going to come to Canada. Well, uh, and, your, and- your sport, John hockey has been the most egregious abuser of the generic injury. The phrase upper body, lower body. Well, you, know, you know, who did that? Here. You know, who invented that? Huh? Who? Pat Quinn. Well, it had to be a Pat, hockey Pat, guy. That's Pat all Quinn. I can tell Pat, you. Pat, Pat Quinn said, do I have to disclose the injury? Yep. Do, you have, do I have to disclose where the injury is? Yep. Okay. It's an upper body injury. Oh, yeah. we never thought of that one. Okay. Okay. We'll let you get away well, with that's, that. You know, with God rest his soul, uh, Pat Quinn has been gone for a lot of years, and I'm sure the upper body or lower body quotation is from 25, 30 years ago. Surely to God, the National Hockey League has had sufficient time to figure out that that's a scam. And they're if they going to have to reveal Bob, the nature they're... of injuries, they could. Oh, they're going to have to when gambling becomes so much more prevalent. And because they're going to be, they're going to be on both sides of the ledger on it, right? Yeah, that, well, the same league that decried gambling as um, you know, the greatest possible sin to, to sport is now as, fully embedded in in it because it, uh, listen the NBA did it too, Bob. The NBA did it too. Involved. Yeah. So anyway, so so but um, Bob's going to find everybody. Eric Scott, you've been fined. Eric, you're fined. I've been fined. Bob's finding everybody because you guys well, the only you person, got a lower but the only person I'm finding is you because I, apparently you're not even <laughs> trying in this show. Um, the other two guys are uh, giving their best effort, and that's all you can ask. Oh now, my goodness. Uh, it brings us to, should we take a break yet? I don't even know where we are. Time sure. Yet. Let's take a break. Sure. Take right, a break. When we come back, I want to talk about the repishage. I don't care what you want to talk about. Uh, oh. I want to talk about the future of this franchise because there are really broad bear, varying opinions about whether this is the nucleus of a championship team that you could rebuild, or is this a team that is destined to be mediocre at best. We'll address that subject and maybe the repishage when we continue after these messages. It's Bob McCown, it's uh, John Shannon. Uh, it's uh, Eric Smith of Sportsnet, Scott Stinson of the National Post, and we're uh, talking about rap basketball and specifically the uh, Toronto Raptors. So we don't know if Kyle Lowry is coming back. The other three big names will be back and have substantial contracts. The center position is iffy. Um, you know, you can make the argument that the three guys, I guess, or four guys that they that could play in that position have shown some abilities, at least three of them have shown some abilities that you might go with. 
But if you aspire to be a championship team, you better make a change that at that position. But is this nucleus so much better than what they showed this year that you could march forward and say 2021 was an aberration and this team can get back at or near the top right away with the right breaks? Stinson, to you first. I think that uh, a little bit depends on what happens with their draft and the draft lottery. I'm cheating a bit on that, but there's a half dozen players who a lot of people think could be very good NBA players. So the Raptors right now have, I believe, the seventh best odds uh, to get a, a top pick. If they end up getting, you know, moving up a couple spots at least, then suddenly you add a guy who's potentially a very good NBA player to that mix. And I think that question becomes easier to answer. And, and you go, you know what? This is a team that was before the pandemic hit, you know, cruising towards second in the, in the East and ultimately came, you know, took Boston to seven games in the playoffs. And, and I think we all thought that they could still cause some damage and, and these young guys would step up and they'd be good. Um, I do think, having said all that, that some of the stuff we thought we would see, Pascal Siakam continuing to evolve, uh, OG Ananobi has improved, Fed Van Vliet has improved, but they haven't quite got to that next level of guys where you'd say, okay, Siakam's a one, uh, Fred's a two, OG is a three. They're kind of like, those guys are probably two, three, and four on a championship type team, and you still need somebody else to slot in above Siakam. So I kind of think that's where I would go with it. I think they can be very good. I think if they, if they get lucky with a draft pick, you know, maybe that person's going to come in and, and be close to that guy. But I'm not convinced after the last, you know, year and a bit that, that those guys can necessarily themselves form the core of a championship team. I think we always thought that the summer of 2021 was going to be when Masai and Bobby Webster decided to go after a big fish and bring in a new star to anchor this team. I'm not sure if that's still realistic, the way the free agent market has unfolded and the way their season unfolded, but I do think they're probably looking to upgrade and not just take the guys they have and turn them into a championship team. Well, every, in, in, in any draft, well, every draft is different. The, the drafts in different sports are, are all, all fundamentally different, but in basketball and especially for the Toronto Raptors where you have, three guys that are going to be your core next year. That's what you expect. You have a point guard who may or may not be invited back and may or may not come back. So you may need somebody there. Um, but if I'm, if I'm the Toronto Raptors, I'm drafting either a center or a point guard, and I'm not the least bit interested in drafting anybody else because I got no place to play them. And I'm not interested in, um, uh, a 19 or 20 year old kid coming out of college who can't play. Uh, we got to fix this thing right now. Trades are always a possibility, but not easy to find um, E a big guy. And right now today, as we sit here with Lowry in the, on the roster, that's the only place I'm drafting. What are you doing? Um. I'm still drafting the best player available, Bob. Uh, I'm not drafting for position and especially where the Raptors are drafting. I mean, listen, it may not be, it may not be up to them in the sense that if they end up slotting at six, seven, well, mm -hmm. it might just be, okay, who's the, who's the best guy available left or all right. Yeah. We will draft for positions now because the five guys we wanted are all gone. If they get the number one or number two pick. I don't think you're worrying about position. I think you're taking the best player that's on the board at that point. Now, Grant. all that, all that said, I, I, I'll, I'll echo what Scott said, and, and I, I guess, Bob, if you, if you want to yell at me for sitting on the fence here a little bit, I think next year, as is right now, fully acknowledging as you just did, a ton of trades could happen. The NBA is ridiculous. It's a circus every summer. Trades with superstars going to different teams and whatnot. So the league, as we know it right now, could still look vastly different by the time October rolls around. But if we deal with the actual what we know right now, the only team, and I might, I, listen, I'll come back on in five months and you can tell me I was flat out wrong. The only team that I still think is invoking fear in me in the East is the Brooklyn Nets. I don't know if they're going to win the championship. I don't even know if they're going to make the finals. But when you've got Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, uh, and, and James Harden on one team, and for a couple of years to come, they're clearly where the bar is set. Don't disagree. As much as, 
as much as Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons had a solid year and Doc Rivers turned that thing around there, the number one seed, I'm not scared of the Sixers. The Boston Celtics, I know Tatum had COVID issues and Brown got hurt late in the year. They plummeted down into the play in themselves. I'm not scared of the Celtics. I'm not scared of the Heat. I'm not scared of the Pacers. I'm not scared of, of, of the Milwaukee Bucks. What has Giannis done to this point? So in saying that, what we could sit here and argue, are the Raptors third best team? Are they the sixth best team? Are they going to be a 7-8 seed and be one of those treadmill teams we always talk about? I think they are a playoff team. Get me into the playoffs. And if I know that there's only one team that I'm really probably scared of, and that's Brooklyn, I'll take my chances then. I might find my way into the finals like the Heat did last year in the bubble as a sixth seed. I might find my way bounced in the second round or into the conference finals. I just think that the Raptors are right there. There's a lot of good teams in the East, but I don't think there's more than one potentially great team as of right now. So why can't well, I be but, one of those good teams then? But are they better with Kyle next year at, at, uh, at point guard or are they better with somebody else? I think they're a better team with Kyle Lowry. Uh, it's just a matter of how much money does Kyle Lowry want? He's not I, gonna take a, or should, or should I say with, with his third, Eric, or should I said with, with the ability to use his $30 million differently. And maybe that was, the fair, maybe that's the fair way to put it. Uh, yeah, that's, that's maybe a better question, John, I guess is, is, it, and then it goes back to what Scott said. The, and, and we talked yeah. about this, I think last time I was on, uh, clearly the money was being earmarked for Giannis and an attempt to, to, to make a serious run at him. And now with him resigning, and so many others from the free agent class already signed up elsewhere. You know, is there that big fish? So are you better maybe to lock Kyle into a, a two-year deal, bring him back for a couple more years, add that high draft pick. It's going to be a top seven pick minimum to the core of an OG Fred Pascal, a young Malachi Flynn, an emerging Chris Boucher and say, you know what? We're a pretty damn good team still. We might not be top three in the East. We might not be top five in the NBA, but we're a pretty damn good team. We're a playoff team. And we're going to go out and compete with this and, and probably give ourselves a pretty good position and pretty good chance still. That's that's I, I think they're a good team. I, I do. I really do. Especially if Lauer's back. Well, we haven't addressed Masai Ujiri and we'll, we'll operate under the premise that he's coming back. We don't know that that's the case, but we'll operate. Let's operate under the, that premise. The one thing we know about Masai is he's not af afraid to pull the trigger on a significant deal. Um, he did that um, and won a championship as a direct result of that move the question then becomes i apologize for my uh, my telephone going off um the question then becomes can he do that again and is he inclined to do that again and if he does then one of those three core players at least is going to go in the other direction just like demar Derozan did um mm. Stinson, have you thought about, about that possibility? Yeah, I think the interesting thing with that is so much of it depends on what happens in the NBA playoffs. Um, you know, as Eric alluded to earlier, these summers are crazy in the NBA where superstars are moving teams and all kinds of strange stuff is happening and, and you know, bolts out of the blue where you had no idea this was going to happen. All of a sudden, Chris Paul's being traded for somebody, you know, some other superstar and, and crazy stuff happens. So I, there's an entirely, there's a possibility where, you know, the playoffs happen, something shakes out and all of a sudden there's three or four teams that we think of as pretty good and pretty locked into their rosters who are suddenly deciding they want to go in a different direction or, you know, Denver decides Denver has a good playoff run when Jamal Murray's not there. Maybe they decide that, they could move Jamal Murray and add some other pieces. And I'm obviously I'm just picking a guy out of the uh, name out of the sure. hat, but there's any number, I think of scenarios where all of a sudden deals that Masai and Bobby Webster might never have imagined as possibilities are presented to them. I mean, that's essentially what happened with a Kawhi Leonard trade, right? Like he was, they were in the process of bringing everybody back and, and the big change they had made was Nick nurse for Dwayne Casey. And then all of a sudden they realized that maybe they could get Kawhi Leonard. And, and so that's, that happened. And, and I think there's entirely a scenario where guys who we think of as essential to the Raptors future, because they were came up through the system and they've been signed to long-term deals uh, are potentially available if the right opportunity prevents itself. So to a certain extent, you have to kind of shake the NBA playoff snow globe and see what comes out the other side. And, and I wouldn't be shocked at all if it ended up being some kind of franchise-altering move. 
you realize, Scott, what you just did? The Raptors Twittersphere just exploded saying Jamal Murray's coming to Toronto. <laughs> Jamal, you, Jamal you, you, Toronto. <laughs> you, you, just, you just did that. You, you just created that, that, that drama right there. Jamal Murray's coming. You did that just by I'm throwing sure. that I mean, way to go. The, the, yeah, other, yeah. the other thing is, <laughs> the other thing I, I just, just from my perspective is that um, I, I, Masai made the Kawhi move when he knew he was this close to winning a championship, when he knew he needed one last pearl in the in the necklace and i mean i don't i mean i i think you have to look at this roster and say i, I i'm not sure how and eric talks about them being a playoff team i'm not sure how close this team is by september of being a playoff a, a, a championship team playoff team is much different than a championship team so i'm not sure they're going to pull a trigger in the summer to get them over the top uh he, he you know he, he what he's done so well in the la in the past few years is done it at the right time. And I'm not sure this summer now is the right time. I think they're in a little bit more of a rebuild than they want to admit. I'll tell you the other thing, and I'm intrigued by the, uh, our guest's reaction to this. That championship team, we talk a lot about Kawhi and the offense and the, and the shot and all those other things. And yes, they were a pretty good offensive team, but they were a very good defensive team. And they were a horrible defensive team this year. And... Um, I don't know how much you can mitigate that, but uh, I think if you're looking forward, um, Kawhi Leonard was is a terrific defensive player, and they had the pieces in uh, the two big guys that protected under the rim um, with experience and shot blocking. Um, we can't forget that those three guys are gone. And you can't just assume that what's left is as good as what it appeared to be when they were surrounded by other players of that kind of quality. So I think, I think there is a real question mark as to where this franchise is. And E, I respect your opinion on, that this is a, a playoff team. That seems logical, but I don't think it's guaranteed at all. And especially not guaranteed because we never got a chance to see this team put their four best players on the court at the end of the year and try and make a run at getting into the playoffs. They never really did that. Your thoughts? Well, and, and, and we might not see it if Kyle Lowry ultimately moves on. So I, I would add him to the mix then Bobcat as well. So, I mean, I, I hear the point you're making defensively. They were not a good defensive team this year. Uh, and, and I'll throw one other name into the mix there. I mean, you, you mentioned Kawhi Leonard, uh, clearly. And Marcus Gasol is a former defensive player of the year. Serge Ibaka has a shot blocker and presence. And Danny Green, who was once all NBA defensive team as well. Danny Green was a hell of a defender too. You lose all four of those guys from your team. And, and I, I can't remember if we've discussed this in, in the past or not. I, I remember saying this on, on my own show one time to Tim Bontemps, one of the uh, great NBA writers from ESPN. I said, the tough thing is for the Raptors, you look at the guys we just mentioned, Bob, Ibaka Gasol, Kawhi Leonard, Danny Green, all four left with nothing coming back in return. Exactly. And, and Bontem said, he goes, well, no, you got a championship. That's what you got in return. So I don't think you can cry over the spilt milk of they left. But the, the, in terms of roster building and, and, and turning something into something else, the Raptors, as we stand here now, yeah, they don't have um, anything to show for uh, those guys outside of the title. That's, uh, you know, clearly something very great to have to show for. But, uh, you know, it, it, I think it's, I, it certainly impacted their roster building going forward. I would have traded for the banner. Yeah. I would trade it oh, all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nobody's, absolutely. No one's arguing that. But I think E's well, point here directly is that you lost the two best players for the Toronto Raptors when it counted, and maybe this is arguable, Kawhi and Ibaka were the two guys that were the biggest difference makers for me on that franchise. And what happens invariably is others get dragged along. And our perception invariably is a team wins a championship. All the players are much better than, than they are they appear to be. And I'm not here to slag any of the guys that are left, except it's presumptuous to assume that because they have a ring, they are somehow a better player than they were before they got a ring. These guys got a ring because of, in my opinion, Abaka and Kawhi. Stinson? Yeah, I, that's true. Um, I'd also note, like, they were a good defensive team last year. In fact, yeah, they were. They had the second best defensive rating in the NBA. Yep. Now, Ibaka and Gasol were on that team, so you know that you can't discount that either. But they did lose Kawhi, they did lose Danny Green, and they were still an excellent defensive team. I mean, 
Pascal is a good defender. OG is a good defender. Everyone thinks that Fred and Kyle are certainly aggressive defenders. You know, they're not necessarily the greatest on ball one-on-one guys, but they, they know how to play. They play hard. Um, I'd also add Nick nurse to that. I mean, he is a, he's an excellent coach. Everybody knows it. He's very good at defensive schemes. Last year, we were all singing the praises of this team and that they were so unpredictable. He was doing different things every night. It kind of seems like this year, like along with everything else that all went out the window, like they were just fell apart. Yep. Yeah. They were just struggling to, to put lineups on the floor and to the extent that he had any sort of his usual mad scientist vibes, uh, he was unable to do that with the rotating cast of characters he had. So it, there's p- conceivably a scenario where when they get a regular lineup and, and whether Kyle Lowry's part of it or not, that they can get back to doing those kind of things that were so successful for them last year, uh, scheming good defense and having a bunch of interchangeable pieces and, and making it work that way. Uh, again, and you've, you've mentioned this already, Bob, but the center position was a, a black hole for much of the year, and it, it got better at the end of the year with the addition of Kim Birch. We'll, we'll see where that goes, um, and that would be a big part of any defensive improvement. But there's the potential there, I think, to get back to a, a, a team close to what they had last year, which was a very good defensive team that wasn't quite good enough in the end to get past Boston in the second round. But but it requires a lot of things to go their way. And, and I think Kyle Lowry is probably a big part of that. It's hard to imagine that, that you could lose him and, and add a, a piece that is going to give you the kind of contributions that he's still able to give at this point of his career. Before we wrap this up, I want to, I want to address that Kyle Lowry situation. And I know you've kind of answered this. John and I had this conversation, I think John, several weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And we talked about, I think I asked you, what would you, what would you offer Kyle Lowry? What is the number? that you would give him. I mean, he's not a $30 million player. I don't think any of us believe, at least not to the Toronto Raptors. Kyle may be able to get 30 million somewhere else. I'm sure Kyle thinks he's still worth $30 million, but he's not worth 30 million, I don't think, to the Toronto Raptors. So John came up with the number 15 million, and I actually said 10. E to you first, what's the number in your mind? What more would generous. you give Kyle Lowry to stay? <laughs> I, I guess I'm far more generous. I might be out of a job real soon if I was running the show. Because as you're talking, Bob, in my mind, I'm trying to decide, am I going 25 or 20, 25 or 20? What am I going to say to Bob and John here? I don't think you're going to be able to convince Kyle Lowry to take uh, a third or even half of what he's making right now. And if, and if you're fine. I agree. I agree. But, but that's why I'm saying I, I'm, I'm willing to let him go. And, and that's and then if you're willing to let him go, that's cool then. Now, I think he might be, and I underscore might be, willing to make that money if he's playing for the Brooklyn Nets or the, I, I don't or know. Or the Lakers. Even, the I was going to say, is it even fair to say the Lakers anymore because they did fall into the plane, but I know there are a lot of mitigating circumstances, yada, yada, yada. If he has yeah. a chance to play in LA. The repershage. We call that the repershage, Eric. That's right. Okay. <laughs> so, point being, I think he would take that money for a legit, championship contender if he's going to come back to toronto to play on a team that's fighting for the playoffs fighting for like the fourth or fifth seed and maybe maybe lightning in a bottle a conference final a championship etc i think he needs to have that number bumped up so i'm saying i'm saying two years at 40 million seems like a pretty fair deal to me uh i would pay that if i were the raptors uh whether kyle lowry likes that or not though remains to be seen Stinson, I got literally 30 seconds. What would you give him? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with Eric's valuation. I think that the thing that works in the Raptors' favor is I don't think there's a whole lot of teams out there that are necessarily going to throw giant money at, at Kyle Lowry. I just I, I think he is of more value to the Raptors than he would be to just about any other team out there. And so I think they're going to feel fairly comfortable giving him what they think is a fair deal and trusting that that's probably going to be the best offer that's out there. We, which Miami, is why Miami, which, which, Miami is something, John, but we got it. We got to go. We no, are, which, which is why you say $15 million. Kyle, you go shop yourself. You go shop yourself. Yeah. If you come back, we'll give you 15 million. Guys, we thank you very much for your time as always. Uh, stay safe. And uh, we'll uh, hopefully have a chance to talk again soon. Thank you, boys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Uh, we'll fun. come back and wrap it after these messages. All right, once again, thanks to uh, Smith and Stinson uh, for joining us. We solved we nothing. Did, we couldn't talk about the repressage. We solved nothing, um, which is not no. um, uh, 
everybody understands that this show is, I think, is, is, is recorded earlier in the day. And, and if you're listening as a podcast, you, you may be, it may have been recorded six months ago. But as of right this moment, the leader at the PGA Championship is Corey Connors, who was going to be a guest on this program, what, two weeks ago, John? Yes. Is two weeks ago? And uh, last the- Thursday. Last Did Thursday. you ever get yeah. a reason why he canceled? Because it may have been. I'm not talking about made. it. I'm not talking about it. Well, um, Lord knows if he'd spent um, enough time with you, um, he may not have been able to shoot five under yesterday um, at the PGA Championship. You know, who knows? He may have shot 85. So he may never come on again. But um, no, no, he may never come on, period. Forget about it again. Well, <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to take a couple seconds and say uh, congratulations to him for a great opening round. And we'll, I think most of Canada, at least golf fans, will be watching to see how things develop over the next uh, few days. Um, we will uh, bid you a fond adieu. Have a swell weekend. And if the crick don't rise, we'll see you again on Monday. For John Shannon, Bob McCowan, bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.